was awesome. Thank you all. That was great. I hope you do see how blessed we are to have the talent we have here at First Baptist Alcoa all the way around, even to Miss Wendy playing the drums over there, rocking it out. Uh, I hope you all are thankful for the effort and the investment that uh, our team makes and Nathan makes. Um, Nathan is uh, truly a genuine lover of the Lord. And uh, a, he's a broken sinner, just like all of us, but, man, he loves the Lord and he knows Jesus has saved us and what a blessing it is. And when we're all broken, what an awesome joy to be together. Turn into James, if you can. We're going to continue talking about uh, James and quarrels, fights, dissension, and the misuse of your tongue and your mouth. It's a real blessing, isn't it? You guys are thinking, man, thanks for more of James, Pastor. We really are loving this. But uh, I'll tell you, we, uh, it, is a, it is an honor to be able to have this perspective in order for us to see our need of Jesus and why it is so essential and so dangerous uh, for us not to put Jesus at the center of our church to make it something other than him. It is so fast for us to move away from the things of God, to move into the direction of our preferences or people and keeping people in order to keep from reaching people and changing and distracting us from the things that really matter. And, uh, and we come to a text today uh, talking about one of the most difficult um, I guess, concepts for us to understand in Scripture. Uh, when I was in college, there was a friend of mine who lived in our little sweet mate up there at UT. He was a sweet mate. You know, you got those four, you got two roommates here and two roommates here, and you kind of share like a big, large meeting area and bathroom space and all this kind of stuff. And one of my sweet mates, he was so um, just fired up about judgment. He always said, no matter what he did, if you ask him about something he was doing in his life, he'd say, don't you judge me. And that was always his statement. In fact, he had on the front of his license plate, he had, judge not lest ye be judged. That was so, he was, I mean, it was, it was part of his life. That's what he was about. I mean, it was like, you know, you just leave me alone. Uh, I can live how I want, do what I want, and act how I want. Um, and, and in a lot of cases, uh, there is truth, and we're going to talk about really the understanding of judgment correctly in how you relate to a brother or sister in Christ. Um, but, but we can take that concept like he did and really confuse it and twist it to really misunderstand what God is saying to us. And this passage that we're talking about today really gets to the heart of the matter of judgment within the church. When it is appropriate and when it is not. Now, it is not right for us to say as Christians that the Bible tells us never to judge. That's just not a biblical concept. In fact, there, is, there are moments when the Bible teaches absolutely the opposite of that. Uh, it tells us to judge. In fact, that is the one thing we do when we gather together as a church fellowship is to judge one another. <gasps> no, that's not right, Pastor. Well, it is, kind of, and I'll show you in just a minute. But there is a dynamic to it that we have to be able to make sense of and, and see that there is a biblical way that we are to walk through this concept of looking at the sin of another. And so James is talking about one side of it, but I want to be real careful before we address this side of it to misunderstand judgment as a whole, okay? So we're going to look at a couple of different passages as we get to this passage. So let's read the James passage, then we're going to bounce around a little bit. Read with me. James chapter 4. I'm going to pick up at verse 11 and then follow through verse 17. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So 
Whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. So the warning is to judge your brother or your sister, and then the uh, explanation is what it creates in your relationship to God when you think like that. Now, judgment of sin in your brother and, or sister in Christ is actually commanded just a few verses from here. I want you to look at chapter 5 at the very end. Look at verse 19 of chapter 5 of James. Look at this. So he finishes the, his letter with this statement. My brothers, if anyone among you wonders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wondering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So don't judge your brother, but judge your brother because if you do, it will cover a multitude of sins. If we don't make sense of this concept and we don't make sense of the distinction between this, we will be very confused about what it means to interact with one another in a church. So before we talk about James's version that he is saying not to do, I want to talk to you about proper judgment in the church. The scripture says that when we see sin in one another, we are to acknowledge it to the other person so that that person can grow to walk and follow Christ. In fact, the scripture says you don't need to worry. This is actually incredibly, uh, uh, an incredible relief in my opinion. You don't have to judge the world. God says, I'll take care of the world. You take care of each other. You don't believe me? Go to 1 Corinthians. I want you to look at this. Go to 1 Corinthians 6. Hold your place right there. The church at Corinth, boy, that, I'm telling you, church at Corinth, they'd made a great soap opera. It's a pretty spicy place. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, I want you to look at this little exchange that takes place. There has been an issue of sexual immorality in the church, and then Paul is teaching those leaders in Corinth how to deal with it. And I'm going to pick up at verse 9. I want you to see what he says about how you address sin in the church. Look at this. He says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with the sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world, or the greedy and the swindlers, or idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what, I ha what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. Woo! Woo! Man, that just, hallelujah. That's a tough passage, isn't it? Paul says, don't worry about the people on the outside. You don't have to worry about them. You don't even have to worry about that at all. The only people you're supposed to be dealing with is each other and your relationship to sin. And the way you interact with one another is you're to acknowledge their sin and then walk them through the process of repentance and restoration and you want them to live that life and you want them to acknowledge it. In fact, that's exactly the goal of any kind of judgment that should happen inside the fellowship or the family of God. We are to address one another's sin to help each one of us trust Christ more. To address one another's sin in order for each one of us to walk closer to one another and to Jesus. So judgment in this case is not wrong. In fact, if we tie that to the passage at the end of the book of James, he's tying these together to say, you know what? Not only are we supposed to address the sin of our brothers and let others dress, address the sins of us, but we're to do that in a way that covers a multitude of our own sin. Do you start to see what's happening here? We're all picking up and carrying each other's weight. We're all walking together to say, you know what? 
I'm not where I want to be with the Lord, but I know i got people around me that will help me get there. You may not be where you need to be with the Lord, but you've got people around you that are going to help you get there. And so what happens is, judgment in this understanding is exactly what God created the church to be in order to make us know Jesus more and reflect Him more in the way we live. And so before we ever talk about the wrong way to judge, I do not want to go anywhere before we understand that judgment is part of what makes us grow. In fact, let me tell you about a crazy moment. You know, when we baptize folks up here, okay? We already know that baptism is not connected to salvation in the sense that it's essential to be saved. Now, I can make the case that anybody who uh, knows Christ, has been changed in that sense, would want to be connected in that way. It would be really hard for me to see a believer who would not want to walk in some mode of that ordinance because they would want to do that. That would be part of who they are and what they've changed. So why would we do it? Well, the reason people get up here and they get baptized is they're making a statement to you. Now, they've already had connection with God. They've already made that connection with God. But up here, something changes. What they're doing when they get baptized, and what you did when you got baptized, is you said, hey, you can look at my life and hold me accountable to Jesus being in me. In fact, you can look at my life and hold me accountable to the fact that I don't look the same. I always try to parallel that to a marriage ceremony. Not the wedding ring, but the ceremony, and I'll tell you why. If you know anything about uh, what pastors do when they f uh, fulfill a marriage ceremony, there's a license that they have to have, and they take this license, and, you, and I fill these things out. I'm always worried I'm going to forget to send it in. But anyway, I fill this thing out. I've got to get this thing filled out or it's not official. And then I sign it, and then it says, witness. So somebody has to witness the ceremony. Now, from that point forward, what the, what the saying is, is that we can always go back to, if somebody says, those two people aren't married, you can say, no, I saw them get married. Oh, you did not. We need the official witness. And we go back to the form. We would look and find the name. We would find that person and ask them. They would say, yes, I was there. That man and that woman joined together. It's a witness. And so baptism, believe it or not, is the moment that you say, everybody look at my life. I am a witness. You are a witness to what Jesus has done inside of me. And therefore, from that point forward, we are a family holding each other accountable. So if you were at my wedding, then you know that the person I married was Kim. And Kim and I are married. Now, if you saw me, this is a terrible illustration, man. As I'm starting to walk down this road, I can already feel it. If you saw me hanging out at a football game, and I'm over there at the Tennessee-Missouri game, and I got my arm around another woman, I'd never do it. What can you do? You can walk up and say, hey, buddy, that's not your wife, right? And what if I said, well, this is my wife, Kim? That's not your wife. I saw you get married. I was a witness. I was there. That's not your wife. There is a ceremony that identifies that moment. When we become Christians, we acknowledge through baptism that we're part of a family, and that family can hold each other accountable through judgment to say, I'm walking with Jesus. So what happens? You gather together at First Baptist Alcoa. You are walking with the Lord. You get out of line in the way you were following God. Somebody walks up and says, hey, hey. That's not your Savior. That's not what you worship. That's not how you ought to live. Now, you may get mad at first, because I can tell you right now, everybody does. Because we have sin inside of us. But the truth of the matter is, if you want to grow in the Lord, don't think you're going to do that on your own. It takes a faith family gathered together, holding each other accountable. Let me show you another place. Go to Matthew chapter 18. We'll get to James in just a moment. Matthew 18 verse 15. 
This is another look at the positive form of judgment and accountability that we see within the church. Look at this process. Matthew 18, 15 says, If your brother sins against you, brother, remember that word, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there, there am I among them. You know, sometimes I see people that like stitch that on a blanket. And that is real sweet, you know, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. But I always think to myself, that's the end of somebody saying, hey, you're not a Christian. <laughs> I mean, we don't ever think about that when we see that in a, in a Christian bookstore. But that really is what that is. That two or three gather together, acknowledging somebody's sin that they will not repent of and work on, is to say, hey, we came to a point where we said, you're obviously not acting like a Christian. And so we have the authority, according to what God has given us as a family of faith, to acknowledge you as not a Christian. And then that's the thing we put on the bottom of a precious moments. Wow! That's what happens to our Bible. So judgment is not always bad. You want accountability if you want to grow in the Lord. I want accountability to grow in the Lord. We need accountability to grow in the Lord. But there is a perspective on judgment that is very dangerous. And when you see this perspective on judgment, it says a lot more about what you believe about your relationship with God than it actually does about the person you're judging. And that's what James is talking about. So let's look at it now. Let's look at that. We've seen the good judgment. Let's look at the bad one. Look what he says in verse 11. This is James 4, 11. It says this. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Now this kind of judgment has a particular flavor to it. It has a particular dynamic to it. It is a dangerous kind of judgment. In fact, the word that the Bible uses in other places is slander. This is a different dynamic than going to your brother and talking to them about their struggles. This is a different dynamic than, than going to someone and saying, hey, you hurt me when you did this. This is a totally different dynamic. This is where you sit down with the other person not present and you speak about them in a negative way. I can tell you there are multiple churches who have been stopped dead in their tracks of what God wants them to do because they spend all their time in slander and judgment of one another. I heard John MacArthur say one time that he had heard rumor that a church across the street in his, or across the, the way in his community was going to have a special service. The pastor was going to have a special service about him. And they were going to talk about all the things that were wrong with him. What a blessing. I mean, you know, what a great church. I mean, <laughs> so anyway, he says that he heard word about this, that the church was going to gather together and talk about all the things that were wrong with him. John MacArthur being a Bible man, I believe him to be a pretty faithful witness over, what, 45 years of preaching. Uh, but he basically says, you know what, gosh, I probably ought to go there for him so they don't end up in sin. So he calls the pastor. And he calls this other pastor and he said, hey, listen, I hear that you're going to have a service and talk about me. He said that the other side of the line was very quiet and that the guy wasn't saying anything. And he said, well, yeah, we're going to talk about some things that, we, that you're doing that we know we don't agree with. And he said, well, I would be happy to come over there 
and answer any concerns or questions or things that you have to deal with. I would be happy to sit down and talk to you about it. He said, in fact, if you want to, you can just leave an open mic for me and I will sit there and let them ask me questions about all the things that have gone on and all the things that they're worried about. And the guy says, oh, we would never do that. That's divisive. <laughs> but what James is talking about is that moment where somebody tells you something about something that has happened and they don't go to that person. And church is full of moments where somebody talks about the sin of another person and talks about the sin of another person and it goes around and then when you ask the question, the biblical question, have you gone and talked to them to get the other side of that story? They always say no. They always say no. See, slander is when everybody takes one piece of something and uses it to twist it on somebody else's character and reputation. They don't have a voice. They don't get a say. It is just a moment where you stand in total judgment of this person as if you know all the information. Now, for you to make a judgment, think about this, for you to make a judgment about another individual without the whole story, makes an assumption about you and your ability to understand things. Now, you know about omniscience, right? You know what that is. Omniscience is, is ultimate knowledge or absolute truth. Now, if you think that you can judge a circumstance or a situation with only half of the situation in your hand and only half the information, what are you saying about yourself? You are saying you have ultimate knowledge because you can fill in the blanks without anybody else. And what James is saying is that kind of lifestyle, that kind of judgment isn't a judgment of that person. It has become a judgment of God. Because you have put yourself at the level of understanding of what he's doing and what he understands. Brothers and sisters, if you want to destroy your church, share half the story over and over and over again. If you want to destroy your church, do not ever address something with the person that you are speaking about. That'll destroy your church. Now, we've been talking about the last few weeks that the difference between the wisdom from above and the wisdom from below. It is the wisdom from below that claims itself as wisdom from above when you speak evil against your brother or your sister and you don't have all the information. And so then you're judging something else. So look at this information. Once you see this, look at James 4 again. Look at verse 11. Let's go, we'll just start at the top again. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law. Now remember we talked about that's the law of liberty, which is the gospel, not the law of the Old Testament and that understanding, and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? To assume you gain information from a situation that was between two other parties and make some assessment of them is to assume that you can fill in the blanks with that knowledge because you are on the same level with God. Now that, that is the judge not lest ye be judged that my friend in college was talking about. To make an assessment or a decision based on what somebody's doing when you don't have all the information and it really doesn't concern you is to judge God himself. To put yourself in his place. So how do we prevent that? How do we prevent that? Well, 
there's a couple different ways. One, it's in this, this word. I want you to see this word here. Look what he says in verse 11. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. Brothers and sisters. Do you know what the other con family connection is that has us putting everything together here? We are acknowledging that we belong to Christ and that he has saved us. We also come in here and admit that we are sinners in order to need a Savior. So when we look at our brother and sister and we look at the gospel that we hold on to, we shouldn't judge a brother or a sister with something more strict than the gospel we have ourselves. So if we start to see the people in the conversation as brothers and sisters in Christ, we will immediately change the way we deal with this information. So if somebody comes to you with half of a story about some other person and you think to yourself, gosh, that's my brother in Christ. If someone were talking about me in that same way, I would really want them to come to me and resolve it. And therefore, what you would do is you would turn to that person and say, hey, have you talked to them to get the complete story? Have you gone to them and discussed this? Have you dealt with this head on? Have you gone to see what was actually going on? You see, somebody who understands what it means to be a brother and sister in Christ understands that sin is a broken thing, that we are broken people, and therefore there are always more details to the situation. And all of us only get forgiveness because we admit our sin. To stand in judgment and slander your brother is to hold them to a standard you will not hold yourself to. Now, the first way that we combat it is to recognize them as a brother or sister in Christ. The second way we combat it is to acknowledge the burden that they carry. Now, let's be honest. Who do we talk about the most in life? It's usually the people in charge, right? I mean, is there anybody around here that's not slandering Butch Jones right now? I mean, they're tearing him up, right? I mean, in fact, we've got people, their whole career is turning on the radio and letting people slander that guy on the radio, right? Is it not people who carry some level of authority that we slander? All oh, that, you know, the properties committee, blah, 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 blah. Those deacons never... Burp, 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 burp. My Sunday school teacher, he never ever, you know, whatever it may be. See, we speak slander against somebody when we don't recognize them as a brother and sister in Christ. And we speak slander against somebody when we neglect to appreciate the burden of leadership they carry. You know, there are a lot of variables that people don't see in other people's lives. But we are quick to make statements on those things we don't speak of. And James is saying, you're trying to play God. You're trying to play God. Now, it doesn't seem like these two things are connected, but they are. I want you to look at the next part. If you look at verse 13, look what it says. Come now. It seems like he's changing subjects, but he's not, and I'm going to show you why. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. You know what he's saying? He's saying be real careful living your life and making decisions and talking about people and giving opinions about things you don't know about because you are just a little mist compared to God. That's it. That's all we are. 
And see, he's wanting us to know, listen, you don't know as much as you think you know about what God is going to do. You don't know, I don't know as much as I think I know, right? There is a perspective that we're to take. And it really all comes from this. If you combine those two things together, here's the question for you, okay? If, if God agrees with your assessment of things most of the time, listen to this, okay? This will change your life. Change his mind. When God is agreeing with your assessment of things most of the times, you might be worshiping you and not God. When Jesus is mad about the things you're mad about about people, when Jesus is, sees the political climate the same way you see it, when Jesus understands all your excuses for why you got upset, when Jesus understands your circumstances and the way you live, it, when you are doing that, be real careful because that Jesus may look just like you. There are many people who are not growing in the Lord because God agrees with them all the time. And they've not thought about how that might have something, that might mean something's wrong. And the thing James wants us to see is we're under his authority. We're under his forgiveness. We're under his grace. So when we hear part of a story we should send that person as fast as we possibly can to resolve it with them and not pass it on. When we hear one side of a story, we should do everything in our power not to judge that from the little amount of information that we have. When we start to think about the way we live our life, we should be real careful to think that God is laying out the plan just the way we want it to go. We're to get under his will. Now, what's good about God is he doesn't leave us there. God gave us a process. In fact, that's what I read to you before, the good side of judgment. God said we're to go to one another, resolve our differences, acknowledge our sin. Now, let me tell you, this is the dangerous part I was talking about. If you would rather speak slander against your brother or sister instead of go and resolve the issue, it might be because you have yet to acknowledge fault in your own life. It might be because you have not acknowledged that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. If you don't want to have a conversation that causes you to admit fault, if you don't want to resolve differences and acknowledge you are a broken person, it's hard for me to see and it's hard, according to the Scriptures, for you to be able to acknowledge that you know this Jesus and what he's done for you. You know, the best thing about the gospel is not that it's for good people. That's the best thing about it. In fact, that's the reason I got on this train, to be honest with you. All right, I didn't grow up in church. I got on this train because I knew something was wrong with me. And then I got to hear about Jesus, and he was like, hey, I like wrong people. And I thought, well, you know, I kind of fit in, uh, so I'll jump in there. We don't gather here together because we don't have any sin. We gather here together because we know it's a problem. And we don't resolve it by passing it around, but by going to the person and dealing with it. Or having somebody acknowledge it in our own life and praying for us and walking with us. Man, I want to tell you, what a great church. What a great church. And, and it's my favorite thing to see when I walk up and down these halls at FBA and I see you all loving on each other and praying for one another and encouraging one another and forgiving one another and resolving things with one another and walking with one another, trusting the Lord when you don't understand what's going on, walking with him to say, hey, listen, I don't know what's happening, but we're going to trust the leadership. We're going to trust the direction we're going. When you do that, when you do that, it says something about what you believe about Jesus. Because to be a Christian, there had to be a point where you said, you know what, I can't make this work. 
I'm just going to have to trust in the one who did. So I want you to check your heart today. Are you living on your own righteousness and judging others by that standard? Or are you trusting in the one who did it all on the cross for us? You see, when a church gets real serious about trusting in the one who did it all for us, it's real hard to speak about somebody else because you know how broken you are. And when a church has Jesus at the center, it runs on his power and nothing else. And that is fun to be a part of. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you, God, that you are the great vindicator. I thank you, God, that you lead us to follow you and walk with you. I thank you, Lord, that you have given us the opportunity to be part of a faith family. I thank you, Lord, that FBA is a place where we can hold one another accountable, not in judgment that destroys or divides, but judgment that reconciles and encourages and purifies us. I pray, Lord, that we would be people under your word, that the truth would always be the thing that we acknowledge, even when the truth doesn't belong to us. I pray, Lord, that we would be people who live out this peace and put ourselves under your gospel message in Jesus. Lord, I know that in a room this size, there are people who have lived their life in their own power. Lord, may today be the day that they acknowledge that they cannot do it. That they need your son. That their judgment of the situation in their life is not perfect. That the plans they've made might not be part of your plan. In all these moments, Lord, we just pray, God, that we would trust in Jesus. May the center of First Baptist Alcoa be Jesus Christ, crucified, risen from the dead. Lord, I thank you that there are sinners here, that we are broken people, that it's a safe place for those who want to have a gospel in their life. May it continue to be a safe place for broken people serve you in Jesus name